Nancy Joshi, and I'm the employer and student liaison at York University Career Center. I'm really excited to be a, a, a part of this panel and pleased to be the moderator for this event. Um, the Career Conversations panel series is sponsored by York University's Alumni Relations, and we'd like to thank them for their generous support. We would also like to thank the Center for Student Success, Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies for partnering with the Career Center to host this afternoon's panel. The purpose of the panel is to provide you with inspiration. We really hope that, you, that hearing the career stories of these professionals will help inspire you along your own journey. We're also hoping that it will provide you with some insight and advice so that you can learn about what it's really like to become an entrepreneur and how to get started in your career. It's also an opportunity for you to connect and network with other professionals. So we hope that you will take that opportunity at the end of this panel discussion. Before I introduce the panelists for this afternoon, there are just a few reminders. If you haven't done so already, could you kindly please register at the back table before you leave this session? Okay. And if you could kindly turn off your cell phones as well, or put them on, on uh, mute. And I'd also like to point out that we are videotaping this event, and we'll have the video posted on our Career Center's website for those of you who couldn't have, for those that couldn't join us today, as well as if you'd like to um, refer back for information about today's session. Um, if you do need to leave, um, you are welcome to do so, but please do so quietly. And also, washrooms are located on your immediate left, so when you exit, um, just make one left and another, so two left. So um, today's uh, panel timeline, so we will from 2.30 to about um, 3.45, um, we do have some uh, questions for our panelists here, um, and then we will be begin to open the floor for questions from yourselves. So, um, and the second portion of our panel today will be um, a networking mix and mingle, so we do hope um, that you will um, take that opportunity to connect. And I'm sorry, can everyone hear me back there? Good, great. Okay, so we wouldn't be here today without our distinguished guests, and I'm very excited to be able to offer, the, sorry, be able to um, introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Um, I am actually going to get our discussion started by asking each of our panelists to, uh, first of all, introduce themselves and briefly tell us about the current work that you do. So um, perhaps I can start uh, with you. Sure. Uh, Robert Merlachi, uh, President and Publisher of uh, Mindshare Learning, a net tech strategy uh, consulting firm. We also are publishers of the Mindshare Learning Report, Canada's leading learning and technology e-magazine. And we also host national events on learning and technology. It didn't happen overnight. I'm a proud graduate of York University. I really hone my skills here at the university as a student, alumnus, and actually an employee at York. Uh, following graduation, I was uh, director of the uh, sport information program here at York, and they studied sport and men along with economics. What I thought I was going to be doing when I entered York versus what I did when I graduated versus what I'm doing now are totally different. So. Uh, three different career paths I've pursued and evolved and augmented my skills, which I'll touch on later on. It's an exciting time uh, to be graduating. It was daunting when I was graduating, but as long as you keep an optimistic outlook, good things will happen. Thank you, Moi Wong Tan, I'm the Executive Director of Center for Information and Community Services. I guess I'm the abnormally here today. I'm not um, an entrepreneur per se. Um, I'm actually running a, a not-for-profit organization, but I was uh, for a brief period of time a management consultant uh, for a few years working with the federal government, uh, which is why maybe I was uh, asked to be here. Uh, we said the only female panelist, I realize. Um, whether that's not a career most women choose, I don't know. Uh, but um, my work has evolved through uh, the past uh, few decades uh, through uh, service in the community sector as well as uh, in teaching. I've taught at a couple of colleges and uh, we'll talk about that later on. So. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Tsai. I work for Kuma Math and Reading Centers, uh, a world largest after-school math and reading enrichment program. 
Um, I served as the head of the Franchise Recruitment Development Department for Canada. Uh, what I do is pretty much recruiting new franchisee, finding new franchisee to open up new units across Canada, and also dealing with uh, franchisees who want to re uh, retire, selling their existing business to a new business owner. And also part of my job function are doing company growth strategic planning, and also franchise operation policy, uh, operation needs, um, pretty much in, in a nutshell. And um, I also try to find a way to entertain my staff every day. So one of my staff members is here today, so he's going to look at me and then laugh at me after today's sessions <laughs> as well. Um, I graduated uh, in 97, also 99, first with a BA, then with a um, Bachelor of Environmental Studies. Pretty much, you can pretty much figure out that I wasn't ready when I first graduated with my first degree. So I stayed in school for another two years, and then I started working at Bell Canada. And then um, move on to do another degree in my graduate study in human resource management. And the reason why I do in human resource <coughs> management during my working with Bell Canada, I learned there's so much thing I can do with HR. And uh, I thought I'd become an HR professional. But somehow after I graduated in 2001, 9-11 uh, happened, so I was told you're overqualified in Canada. We, don't really, we don't really don't need a graduate degree in HR for you to work in HR department. So somehow I end up with my current company, Kumon Canada, and um, doing franchising. So um, it's a very interesting career path, and I kind of look back. There's one moment, uh, there's one thing that I did it when I did my second year in university, a uh, friend of mine, we actually opened up uh, a computer service at my basement. And somehow, when that kind of paid off some of my tuition, and uh, I stopped and he continued to be in that industry. So, am I an entrepreneur? Yes. Uh, I also like to work for corporate as well, so there's a combination in there. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rick. Everybody hear me okay? How's everybody today? Enjoying the uh, new spring? Well, in spring, about 37 years ago, I was in this room, um, probably almost in this spot, uh, planning the overthrow of York University. I was uh, a personality at Radio York, uh, which is another whole story, but um, the radio station decided that they would put me up for election as the president of the Council of York Student Federation and we would run on a separatist policy. Uh, we, of course, had no chance of winning, uh, but we were going to separate from Canada, declare York University a free zone, a legalized gambling, all the other vices included, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had a lot of fun, and I actually came in second, <laughs> which was really, second or third, I don't know, it was really quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, this, this room has a lot of memories for me. Um, as I said, we were probably sitting around here because the bar was just over there. It was a, it was a when did they take booze out of here? Well, I'm going to stop making alumni donations. That's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sat here when the 1972 uh, Russia hockey series, the the, the university was closed. Um, in those days, nobody was interested in career. I shouldn't say nobody. None of none of my friends were. We were interested in more. Um, well, I'll leave that. It's better said for another day. Uh, pursuits. I did graduate in 1975, but I'd worked part-time. Uh, I, I came from a working-class family, so you know, parents provided me a place to live in three squares a day, and that was great, but I paid for everything else. And I worked as a security guard most of that, most of that time. Had no interest whatsoever in this stupid occupation, it wasn't a profession. But somehow, uh, in 75, I graduated, and I thought, well, what do I do now? Um, I was enrolled as, a, as an officer cadet in the um, Canadian Forces, so I did some military training that summer. And then in the fall, okay, it's time to, uh, to go on with your life. So I saw this ad in the newspaper for something called domestic surveillance. Anybody have any idea what that was? No, of course you wouldn't. It was divorce work. So what I did was I um, sat in a car uh, outside people's houses and um, watched them cheating on their spouses. Fun? Wow. Um, I had, this, I had this bizarre notion, although I didn't have the brains for it, to become a lawyer, um, but I never pursued that because there were a lot of lawyers I eventually ended up working for doing criminal defense investigations who uh, 
left the profession and uh, one guy opened up a chain of sandwich shops in California. So I hope he's doing very well, he was a good guy. But at 21 years, 22 years of age, I was running around doing homicide investigations, drug work, uh, things I had no idea about. I thought this was really, really neat. Since then, I've, I've held several corporate positions uh, with security. Um, I was um, corporate security, security manager of um, Northern Telecom, um, which then became Nortel, which then became nothing. And we dealt with spies and terrorists and all kinds of uh, all kinds of other neat people. I'm, I was a commissioned officer with the Canadian Forces Security and Intelligence Branch. Uh, and if I tell you anybody about that work, then I have to shoot you. Um, I then owned my own company, which was known as 1440, and it was a private investigation firm that specialized in um, intellectual property protection, counterfeit <coughs> t-shirts, watches. Uh, most of me is fake. Um, and one of the big jobs contracts I had was with the distributor of Cuban cigars in Canada. In the 90s, everybody had to have a Cuban cigar. They couldn't afford them, so they bought fakes. And I ended up um, having supper with Fidel Castro, me and about 150 other people in Havana, but that was quite, a, quite an event too. It's quite a story uh, associated with that. Two and a half years ago, I sold my business. Um, now I still do some consulting. Um, one, of, one of my gigs is with this company, Northwest Protection Services, and um, I've been heavily engaged in recruiting people for this company, and if you're interested um, in, a, in, a, in a good job that could lead to, um, to um, the same kind of career path as I, I was in, um, speak, speak with me. Um, I still do some private investigation work, but I'm kind of, um, kind of um, restricted in what I do. I do some writing, and uh, my favorite color is green. <laughs> Some of it's true. <laughs> um, I'll just say for what it's worth. <laughs> um, and I'd like to also introduce Malcolm James. Thank you. So one question. 1440. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good. Do you want to hear that story? It, it's not that long. Okay, um, I, I, the, the only <coughs> aha moment I had in business was about three o'clock in the morning when I decided to, to take the plunge and, and get into business myself as an entrepreneur. And um, I thought, what am I gonna call it? I, I don't have an ego to call it Rick Leswick and Associates or whatever. So I remembered the guy, this Northwest Protection Services, I was renting a room about the size of a phone booth and they had a telephone number, it was called their hello line, that was answered 787 uh, it was called, it was 771440, they answered it 1440, I thought, aha, that's going to be the name of my company. And we subsequently found out that there's 1440 minutes in a day, and so great for the PI business because we snoop all the time. Thank you for asking. Isn't questions. that interesting? Figure it out on your uh, things, 1440 minutes. Okay. So, uh, my name is Malcolm. I uh, own a company called Projects Canada. Uh, by profession, I'm a project manager. I graduated York in 94 uh, with the, the very practical degree in philosophy and sociology. And, um, uh, you know, had immediate aspirations that I would get into the professional work world with large enterprises. Um, I've worked with uh, quite a number of companies, both as a full-time employee and for the last probably four years, I guess, um, as an independent uh, consultant. So I worked with IBM, Toronto, uh, Toronto Dominion Bank, National Bank, Bank of Montreal, currently with, uh, with Rogers uh, Communications. Um, as a project manager, uh, my specialty is in complex systems integration, so I'm on the IT side of uh, the universe. Um, but you really have a, a unique opportunity in, in this profession to, to specialize in what you want to specialize in. There's a wide variety of roles in, in any given projects, in any given project, and there's a wide variety of industries with different types of projects, construction projects, application development projects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for me, it's a fascinating, a fascinating field um, in that it, it really allows you to interact with a wide variety of individuals, uh, different types of technologies, different types of business problems. And it allows me to keep active in, uh, uh, from an academic perspective. There's a, a complete certification curriculum associated with project management. And that's something that's been interesting to me. It's a constant uh, um, evolution in my skill set and, and uh, continual development of myself as an individual as much as a, a professional. Thank you. My name is Vexis Sizmeric. Uh, I graduated from New York in 2005, and uh, prior to founding the two corporations that I manage today, um, 
My only aspiration in life was to become an NHL hockey player. So for about 20 years, I uh, played competitive and professional hockey. And unfortunately, after a lot of struggles and many bumps and bruises, I had to transition into something that really came naturally to me, and that was uh, working in, in the business setting. Uh, today, I uh, oversee two businesses. One specializes in management consulting and software development for particular verticals, uh, such as parking, airport maintenance, and healthcare services. And the other one is a startup about four years in the making that called uh, Universal Medical Systems. And um, that particular build uh, organization has a single flagship product called MediPal which is a unique drug prescription management system. So thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Um, I know some of you share some of the pivotal or unexpected moments, um, but I, I wondered um, if anybody wanted to sort of expand and, and share, what were some of the you know, pivotal or unexpected moments that sort of set your career in motion? Hunger. <laughs> <laughs> Fear is a great motivator as well. Um, when I, I had the good fortune of, uh, anyone watch Dragon's Den? Kevin O'Leary and Dragon's Den, the really mean guy. I worked for him for almost three years. Um, after leaving York, I segued into the educational technology space. I had a real passion for learning and I saw technology as the future. Didn't know a lot about it, but I saw it as the future. So I launched the Learning Company School Division and subsequent to that, I was hired uh, by a, as a VP of a dot com in the U.S. called Learning Station. And when that crashed and burned, I uh, was kind of left wondering, what do I do with my career now? And I had been part of a leading brand that was acquired by Mattel, the learning company, where Kevin made all this money. And uh, so, and then experiencing kind of a whole new emerging space which is known as cloud computing a dozen years ago and uh, it, at that point it was referred to as ASP model application service provider model and uh, so I actually enrolled in a careers as a, a consulting as a career option through the federal government I thought I've never tapped into the federal government for anything so I paid enough in taxes and I, and I ended up taking this six week course on, it was like a mini MBA that kind of launched my consulting career uh, as Mindshare Learning. And, um, and then further to that, I augmented my skills with a master's in educational technology at Pepperdine in California. So that was transformational for me when I was, you know, in the crunch looking to, what am I gonna do now situation much like you're in now where you're kind of maybe graduating or have graduated and I think being here is your first step to success in looking in, at, at this space as a career entrepreneurship and consulting I never anticipated I go down this path but having control of your destiny when you're running your own business is it, pretty compelling but it's it is very hard work, and I think for those who run their own business, it's you know, spending you know being up till two eight p.m. is not uncommon uh, working on a project. So, with that, I'll pass it on over. You know, I I, uh, I think you sorry, I think you hit on something really key. There's one theme that sort of resonates uh, through everybody's story to a degree, and that's having a situation that changes or where you change and decide you want to do something else and recognizing the opportunity and, and making the jump. Um, in, my, in my own case, when I was a student at York, after I graduated with a, an undergrad degree, I was debating between getting into the professional world and, and carrying on uh, in academics. And I actually did a semester in, uh, at Osgood Hall uh, before realizing that my childhood dream of being a lawyer and a criminal lawyer uh, wasn't what I wanted and I recognized it quickly enough to make a jump and get into the profession. I responded to a tiny little ad about gay big in the newspaper um, and landed a, a gig with IBM. Um, and you know the, the, the jump into project management was a similar, uh, a similar experience meeting opportunity or interest meeting opportunity kind of a, a turning point. 
uh, I was actually working in a technical capacity on a project when the, uh, the management team that I was working with recognized that the product we had, uh, we had deployed was becoming a de facto standard and they didn't have anybody who knew the product well enough to roll it out to other business units that were interested. <coughs> so the technical team that implemented the project was ultimately the project team that went on to roll it out across North America and then globally through IBM. Um, at the time, it was a breaking edge technology called Live Assist, and, and we see it now on virtually every website where there's a call me or a text chat button. Um, but uh, our little project was the first to do it in IBM and integrate their, their call center environment with their websites. Um, and it, you know, it was really just a fortuitous moment and, and opportunity in recognizing here's a, a chance for change and here's a catalyst for change and jumping at the opportunity. So seizing it. Seizing the moment. <laughs> Um, and I think you also touched on a lot of um, what we also often um, share with our students is we're, we're living in a mobile market, right? And so um, it's, it's, not, um, it's very often that students will pursue one degree, but then often um, their career path will, will take many different directions. And, and you can see that from some of the experiences that you've already shared. Um, the question we have for you is um, there are all kinds of statistics um, that indicate a large number of small businesses uh, fail in the first few years of operation. So um, what type of advice would you have for students and new graduates who are considering um, becoming an entrepreneur or consultant and, but are concerned about the risks involved and the perceived lack of um, job opportunity or security? Does anyone want to take that question uh, first? I'll take a stab at it. Sure. Um, I, you know, I think you want to start small. I think you know, my advice to you would be, you know, be conservative and don't try to go big, too big, too quick because I suspect that's why a lot of companies fail. You have to have a crystal clear vision, well articulated business plan, and, um, <clears throat> you know, be prepared to put skin in the game. You can't go asking for money unless you put your own skin in the game because you will not be taken seriously. You know, that, that's super critical. What does skin in the game mean? When Kevin O'Leary started his new fund and he was being interviewed on the uh, Rock TV, they asked him specifically, how much skin in the game do you have in this O'Leary fund? And he said, I put $2 million of my own money in. That's skin in the game. Is he really as insufferable a jerk as he appears on TV? It's a, it's a bit of a shtick, but he is a tough, tough guy. And, uh, I learned a lot about business and how not to be like him in many ways. Excellent. <laughs> and by the way, I'm tweeting about this if you want to follow me at my share learner. <laughs> Can I add on some more points? Yeah. Uh, one other thing that you need to, if you want to start up a business is the network. Like you can't really say, I have a great idea, I want to do something, and you jump into it. And without people knowing what are you trying to do, and what are you selling, or what kind of service you're providing. So you, have to, you must have a very clear vision for your own business or your own consulting uh, services that you're going to provide. And try not to, you need to develop a very thick skin. Go to a network uh, event, network meeting, like today's event would be a great opportunity to learn from other people and also learning. You need to constantly learn and then to improve your own competency and also your own skills. You might hear something today and you might be able to use it the other day. And that's gonna help you in the long run. Thank you. Do you often um, build an, an A team around you? So as uh, do you consult with other experts um, within your field? Um, how, do you, how do you ensure when you are um, putting proposals forward do you get um, you seek advice from others and, and you know who are those potential partners can I share something from the social service sector Absolutely. I think there is actually some similar similarities we're also talking about social enterprises these days uh, I think in addition to having a clear focus your own plan as to what you want to achieve your goals and, and, and your work plan you do need to network in addition you need to keep track of the trends that are happening in society um, what are the new trends, what are emerging trends, and you not only network with people who are 
um, in your field, sometimes it's good to network with people from totally different field because that's when you can have interesting things happen, um, like a collision of ideas or, or um, interdisciplinary exchanges might just create something, a, a new spark that you haven't thought of. So if you want to be innovative, I think innovation is key these days. Um, many things have been tried before. Um, for, for you to uh, stand out from others, I think it has to be some innovation, innovative ideas that you have or innovative ways of delivering a, a service that will put you apart from the others. Thank you. Uh, I can also add to that and I'll answer the previous question as well. Uh, when I look at... Yeah, when I look at being an entrepreneur, I, I take a little bit of an unorthodox approach. To me, it's a matter of probabilities. So I don't put all my eggs in one basket and focus on growing one business and establishing one idea. Over the course of the last 10 years, I think I've started probably 20 different businesses. Uh, so in, in my opinion, I, I would say the probabilities on your side, the more ideas you can generate and the the way that you think about creating and, and funding and growing the different businesses. And that naturally takes you to the, the, the second question, which is do you surround yourself with A-type personalities or great people? That's really the basis of any <coughs> great organization. Uh, so as, as you, you know, think outside the box, you come to determine that you by yourself will never be successful as an entrepreneur or as a businessman. It's always a matter of establishing a network, a network of individuals that have a particular skill set or an expertise in a vertical, for example. And that, that's, in my opinion, what will make you successful. But being an entrepreneur is really secondary to being an innovator, and the more ideas you can generate, the greater the probability that you will succeed. Thank you. If, if, I, if I could just uh, add to that, excellent points. Uh, and, uh, you know, innovation is key and uh, as well, and following your passion. I, I think that's, you know, being networking, but really, truly following your passion. And that's where a lot of us uh, were pursuing degrees that don't really relate to what we do today, but it allowed you to explore and discover what are your true skills, you know, who are you, where do you want to go with your life? And if you find something that you're really passionate about, I was passionate about being a hockey player as well, and I thought I was gonna play in the NHL when I played junior level. But I did not, I realized at one point I wasn't gonna make it. And I did have the good fortune playing against Wayne Gretzky when I was 14, the only time he played in Toronto in the GTHL, and I have video to prove it. I have a degree, he doesn't. He might have an honorary degree, I have a legitimate couple of degrees. But uh, the other question I was going to ask, speaking of network and forming your network and building your network, you know, I'm innovation technologies, I live it every day. How many of you are on LinkedIn currently? How many of you have LinkedIn as a uh, <coughs> tool to create your network? You know, LinkedIn, I think, is a very powerful tool to use. And particularly when you're looking for a job or to establish yourself in a career, uh, I get pinged a lot on LinkedIn. I'm selective. I don't link with everybody randomly. But you want to build a presence online. How many of you have a website? Your own personal website? Really, the future is that's your digital portfolio to amplify your message and really tell the world who you are. And you know our website is mindsharelearning.com. We just refreshed it recently, and it's an ongoing effort to keep it fresh, keep it current, stay current. I think that's really critical today in uh, this kind of just-in-time world we live in. Thank you, Robert, for mentioning LinkedIn. It is um, a powerful recruitment uh, source, and actually about seventy percent of uh, recruitment is now conducted through LinkedIn. So, uh, thank you. Of that. Um, I have a question in terms of if you were to look back, is there anything that you wish you had known when you were getting started in your career and uh, what, what, what really helped you uh, to get to where you are today? Uh, but more quickly, what, um, sorry, uh, 
but today, but more quickly, um, what would have helped you get to your career today more quickly and more easily? When I was at York University, I was one of those students who didn't know what to do uh, with a career when I was in second year. I was actually in the um, science stream, environmental science, doing biology courses, earth sciences, and all that stuff. And um, after I graduated, I, I worked for a very short time in an insurance company, doing a lot of calculations. And I was bored to tears after the training, training period was over, which was three months. So I was, bored, I was bored for another few months until I saved up enough money for tuition to go back to university. So I went to uh, uh, the MES, uh, Environmental Studies. Uh, I focused in uh, human services. Initially, I, I was going to study air pollution. But then I met somebody, who, a fellow student, who said she was studying gerontology. I said, what is that? A lot of people think it has to do with uh, study of gemstones, gematology, but it, it was actually gerontology. And after I talked to her, I, I found a summer job working in a nursing home. After that, I realized that I really loved that. So I switched completely to human services studies, a study of health uh, and, and elderly, so management of healthcare facilities and so on. So I think getting to know different workplaces because what you have in mind um, in abstract may not be what you want to work in. Um, at that point, I was still interested in working in a nursing home um, at some point in my career. So I was actually interviewed to be executive director at one point, but I was 26 when they found out how, how young I was, they didn't want to hire me. Um, I thought it was too much, too much responsibility for a 26-year-old to run a nursing home. I was rather tipped, uh, uh, not too happy about that. But I just turned my career on a different path altogether. I, after I graduated, I landed on a job in a Regent Park, uh, working with seniors in a community setting. And uh, I loved it. I got to see the underbelly of Toronto. Um, I really understood what some seniors lives were, um, you can sort of foresee if you don't do certain things or if you do certain things, this is how you're going to be living when you're 70 years old or 65 years old. So it was kind of eye-opener for me. And um, after that, I, you know, I, I ended up in race relations by accident, sitting on the mayor's committee and becoming the co-chair of the mayor's committee on uh, race relations. And that somehow got me off to another job. I took me to Ottawa working for immigrant service organization, which I never thought I would do because my focus was gerontology, remember? My passion was, you know, help, uh, basically uh, caring for the elderly. So it, it sort of turned around, but it's still working with human beings, just a different age group. So they're transferable skills. So it's good to remember, nothing is really wasted. Uh, their transferable skills, working with seniors or working with the immigrant group is the same skills, running an organization, the admin skills are the same. And then through that, I ended up on the Royal Commission as one of the part-time commissioner, on the Royal Commission on the Systemic Racism in the Ontario Criminal Justice System, which got me into many prisons in Ontario, which is another eye-opener. Um, so I've been through quite a few interesting places. I've also worked at Jane and Finch Community, which is right near here. Um, in one of my summer jobs. So I think all that together really enriched my experiences. And right now, in an organization that serves newcomer, I have so much I want to share with them. And also, now we're beginning to do environmental projects. I haven't thrown away my environmental science roots altogether, because now with uh, some of the young people, with, uh, for example, some of the environmental groups in Toronto, we're saying we can create a social enterprise. So we're thinking, from gardening to uh, probably food distribution or down the road, a kitchen, maybe running a little uh, caf cafeteria. So I might still get into business yet. So we're doing social enterprise, so everything is really interlinked. Um, nothing you've learned in university or in different jobs uh, is wasted because you can link them together. You never know when the moment comes when you can utilize it in a new format or in a new uh, arena. So just want to share that, you know, we don't want to be too compartmentalized. Many things really can flow together eventually or at some point in time. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else like to um, share? Sure. 
the, I, Moy, I think you hit on a number of, of really key things. I don't know if I'd say that, that there's something I would have done differently looking back, but looking back, one thing that, that it has been a constant in, in my professional uh, life has been a service, uh, an orientation to working with people and being of service to other people. Um, from humble beginnings as a waiter through to working uh, in, a professional, uh, in a professional capacity, um, I think that that service orientation can be key. And, and so I guess if I generalize from that, I think there are certain attributes that you bring as an individual that are unique to you, that you find motivating and empower, uh, empowering. And recognizing what those things are and how to put them to productive use um, can be a real differentiator for you. You'll specialize and potentially find something that you're a lot more interested in and you get a lot more enjoyment out of. And that is a positive cycle to it. Um, I think a key is adaptability in, in every circumstance, recognizing when it's time to change, recognizing when, um, uh, when there's a great opportunity in front of you, and learning how to deal with change. And uh, in, in my experience, and I don't know if yours is the same, I don't think that I was taught growing up how to deal with change. You're taught to deal with a lot of different things. There are a lot of uh, professional skills that you can pick up. But in terms of, of being able to, to turn on a dime, um, recognize when it's time to stop doing things a certain way, start doing them differently, those are skills that I think you can, you can pick up and master and will benefit you greatly, particularly as a, an entrepreneur, where, where you may try something and it may not work, and, and you need to know when to quit. In project management, you need to know when you've sunk enough money into an initiative and it's time to stop. Um, and uh, and go and, and focus on something new. Uh, so I think that those are some of the key things that, that I've picked up over the years. Thank you. Um, I guess along those lines, because um, we are coming up to the open uh, Q&A session, um, what would you say, if you could leave each student here today with one nugget of advice um, concerning their careers, what would it be? And I'd like to start with... Perseverance, and it's it's a trait, it's a characteristic that I don't know if you can learn yourself or, or if you can study and, and <coughs> obtain. But um, I think perseverance. So ne never quit, regardless of you know what the obstacles may be. Create a vision wall and have that be a reminder every single day what your end goal is. Thank you. Um, I think I would I would um, I would say. Build and, and cherish uh, the relationships uh, around you. I think that that's really critical. Um, and it's amazing how they will come back again and again and again through your working life. Um, and maybe we call it networking, maybe it's simply just uh, uh, establishing effective relationships. Uh, that's really been absolutely critical. And in the course of the work that you do with people and, uh, and uh, the relationships that you do establish, be careful with your reputation. Um, your professional reputation is, is critical and it will precede you. Uh, people will remember your work uh, and the quality of, of the relationship that you establish with them long after they've forgotten the specific piece of work that you did. Thank you. Rick? Okay, well, I'm going to probably um, be impaled when I leave here, but with all due reference to my colleagues here who are, who are um, out of people, I think you got to turn this off once in a while, okay? I really do. My business is people-oriented. I have never hired anybody by LinkedIn. I've never, I've never, I bought this two weeks ago, okay? I'm serious. Lived without it quite well, 
all that time. I had a, I had a cell phone that uh, the kids used to laugh at, say it was a museum piece, okay? Functioned quite well with that. Um, I'm not proud of being a dataphobe, okay? I remember when I was at university here, talk about nerds. They were guys who were beat up regularly, carried around, remember, stacks of cards and things like that, okay? Get rid of this once in a while. Develop your people skills, okay? When I hire somebody, when I contract business, I want to talk to them. I want to see what they look like. I want to see how they react. You can put all kinds of bullshit on this thing, okay? Put it away. You know, there's going to be a whole, I, want, I should have gone to chiropractic college now because there's going to be a whole um, uh, business in, um, you know, Megan and Jonathan doing this all the time, okay? Their shoulders are going to be down. Relax. Um, I got about 200 emails in the last uh, two days. One of them was important. And I got it too late. Okay? I'm not going to shoot myself. <laughs> Put it away once in a while. Here. <laughs> I actually agree with Rick. Actually, my dad's a chiropractor, so uh, sure. <laughs> anyone here need help, just uh, come over. <laughs> uh, I think one thing that uh, everyone needs to keep in mind is when you graduated, uh, don't think it's uh, a privilege you have a degree already. I remember uh, once I interviewed a, uh, an MBA graduated, not from Schulich, luckily. I was very happy from a different school. Uh, he told me, he asked me the question, what's my working hour? And can I work three days a week? Uh, do I get this time out, get this benefit, that benefit? The interview only lasts 30 minutes. Then I sent an email to him, and I said, thank you very much. And then I said, well, then I left a very personal note on that email. I, then I told him, uh, I'm very happy you got your MBA, but you still need to get your hands dirty. You need to get your hands dirty. Uh, my own experience is, well, well, was when I first, such, when, I, when I actually graduated from my uh, master's degree, came back uh, from the United States, it was 9-11. Things that actually happened to me was, Bell Canada says, we're going to rehire you. Uh, Coca-Cola said, we're going to hire you. I went through three uh, interviews three times, but heck, I'm freeze. End up with Kuman Canada, my current employer. Um, the general manager at the time pulled me through, hired me $10 an hour, work at the center, a company-owned center by Kuman head office. I was pulling the worksheets for the kids. So a week, I'm working about like three hours. So you, you can imagine how much money I make per, per week. I was waiting for a job for a year, and my mom was like crying, what, what went wrong? I think one thing that I learned is, regardless what happened right after you graduated, know what you need to do, and really pick it up things that you can do. And do not afraid and says, I'm a university graduate, I shouldn't be doing that. I should be doing something much better. No, that's just totally wrong. Get your hands dirty and gain that experience. And one day you're going to be appreciated. You actually went through that experience. And if anything happens again, you'll be able to adopt and cope and be able to deal with it much better. Um, I would say really understand yourself better know what your passion is because then you can find your own niche, what you're good at. Um, the two have to intersect. Your passion and your uh, talents have to intersect. And then you find the right opportunity so that you can excel. Um, as I'm surprised by so many panelists who have an ambition to become an NHL player. That's one passion I did not have. <laughs> but uh, um, I think you need to know exactly what you want to do with your life, the general direction, because you hear most of us have gone through meandering path. Nobody has one career. I think increasingly, few people are going to have just one career. There may be two or three different career paths in your, in your work life. So you have to be adaptable and um, <laughs> Be, be ready to, to adapt to new roles or, or new situations and remain optimistic, believe in yourself, surround yourself with people who will encourage you, not make you miserable. And uh, if you haven't found a job yet, you have some time on your head, 
please volunteer. Consider yourself, uh, contribute to the community. Um, the CICS is one of many, many organizations and many not-for-profit organizations out there who are happy to take your skills, put it to use, and there will be a line on your resume that you have experienced helping an organization do a professional job. My, my nugget of advice, and it's amazing, some, some great advice. I wish I got this kind of advice when I was starting out. I truly believe this is extremely valuable. Uh, first of all, uh, I did use a career center when I was graduating and really helped me with my resume at the time. It was very valuable service and sat in on a seminar about that and that was extremely powerful, pulling together you know, my best assets, if you will. But uh, the main nugget of advice I have for you is don't be afraid of failure, okay? All too often, we are discouraged from making mistakes. No entrepreneur has ever failed, not failed. I mean, you learn, the, the learning that you have when you fail at a project, if any of us fail, like, let's put up our hand Little quick little survey of the panelists here. Has anyone ever not failed in a, in a project? Today? <laughs> I mean, we've, we've all failed at something. I remember launching the ultimate sports locker that was going to go into every home in Canada for your sporting goods. And we were going to be on the uh, Home Shoppers Network and Big Break program and signed a deal with the biggest shelving company in Canada, had licensed it. Then I got the question, how much does this thing weigh? Because it was that melamine stuff, like, you know, what kitchen cupboards are made of, uh, some cupboards and counters, and it weighed almost 100 pounds. Well, you couldn't ship the thing. You could not ship it. So that project failed, but I just moved on because a, a plastic mold for that same thing was going to cost half a million bucks, and I knew that it just didn't make sense. The <coughs> learning I went through in developing a new product, taking it to market, production, one in 10,000 products goes to production. I got it to production, focused on the positives, and it was all good. And then I moved into the learning technology business. But I still did manage to maintain my personal human connections and, and networking because to my colleague's point, the one that I want to throw away is BlackBerry. Uh, it's really important to, to really focus on your human skills and interpersonal skills. And, and I agree, that I think that's being lost today and has to be nurtured more, more often. Thank you very much. Um, I'm you. sure that um, with all the inspiring advice that you provided, I'm sure that um, the audience has um, many questions for you. So I do have a couple questions of my own, but I am going to actually now open it up to uh, discussion, uh, to questions from the floor. So I just ask that you please stand up and I will repeat your question. Um, keep in mind that you will have an opportunity to meet with our panelists one on one uh, to ask your individual type questions. So if we could sort of keep them um, related to the group at this time, that would be great. So I, um, does anyone want to start with a question? Yes, please, the gentleman just said, right hi. Uh, so my question to you is, what do you think the future of the workforce in Canada is like? Is it people shifted from the corporate world to entrepreneurship? Because I think that is the trend, and I think Forbes uh, ranked Canada as number one can, uh, country to open the business in. So what are your thoughts? Well, it's shifted a long time ago. You're absolutely correct. Um, I, I had two very senior corporate positions, and I had absolutely no intention of, of remaining there. Uh, much to the consternation of my, my dad who spent 32 years working for the railroad at very menial jobs and when I worked for Northern Telecom for example he said oh this is great you're gonna have great pension you're gonna well <laughs> you know what happened at Northern Telecom don't we okay so um, no I, I, that's a very wise observation on your part um, I think entrepreneurship is the way to go there's gonna be much more contract uh, positions available. Um, I think that's that's a trend, and uh, this is completely unschooled because I don't have an MBA. I I don't read the financial pages. I just mm -hmm. have sort of an intuition. Good question. Yeah. I'd like to add that um, because because we are fast becoming a global village. Uh, just today we were told that uh, some IT equipment will be arriving late because of the flood in Thailand, 
and I just spent a couple of weeks in Thailand for vacation, and I said, how does that work? Because uh, apparently companies in Thailand that manufacture computer equipments that are supposed to be shipped to Canada. So I think you have to set your side further than Canada is what I'm trying to say. You have to look at an international community, not just Canadian market. Uh, if you want to work uh, as an entrepreneur, quite often you find that the market may be outside of our boundaries, geographic boundaries. You know, Canada is a great place to do business. It really is. We're very fortunate to live in this country that is probably one of the most stable economies in the world. And uh, to that point about Ford, Forbes ranking Canada number one, a lot of my clients are U.S. based and they want to come to do business with us in Canada. So we're very fortunate that way. And there's some great programs if you're looking to start your own business, uh, seminars you can take, do your homework before you start your business and have an expertise and focus uh, because it's competitive. It's a competitive landscape out there, but if you're laser focused on a, on a particular product or service and know it inside out and have the expertise, you can, you can be successful at it. That's why we launched uh, from a, you know, at Tech Consulting, we launched a national e-magazine in Canada that's now the leading publication we do podcast interviews, video interviews, and we carved out uh, a niche because it didn't exist. Okay, it didn't exist, and we created it. So you, you pick your spots and look for opportunities. Well, I got fired regularly. I know you might find that hard to believe with this sterling personality of mine. But uh, firing was not a bad thing necessarily. Uh, every time um, you just tried to pick yourself up and, and uh, go forward. So like if somebody said something about failure, uh, absolutely, you know, there, there, there is no failure. I don't know if I would contribute it to my ADHD or the fact that Perhaps in my first 26 years on this planet, I moved 22 times and it kind of became inmate. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are individuals who look forward to change as a new beginning, new opportunity, and those that prefer, you know, that even keel. If I think back, uh, in my experience, sometimes, uh, sometimes I've made a conscious choice and, and had the TSN turning point where I recognize that this isn't what I want, this isn't rewarding to me anymore. And, and other times it's been the people around me that have recognized an opportunity or made an opportunity available. And so listening and, and being aware of those opportunities can often give you insight that you may not actually recognize. Um, moving into project management was actually the, the wisdom of uh, my direct manager uh, at the time who put me into the position before I knew I was formally actually becoming a project manager. And it just so happened that, uh, that it was an interesting opportunity, rewarding to me, and, and it was the catalyst that moved me. So sometimes you choose it and sometimes it chooses you. Um, and I think it, it's a matter of just being adaptable and open to the uh, possibilities. in consulting on like what's your core expertise so you, are you a graduate like what, no, what's your third year. third year in what uh, okay 
So what I would suggest to you is you probably, if you, if you are serious about that, try to get a part-time job working in that field now in advance of graduating because you can't graduate and suddenly become a consultant, right? You, you just, who's going to hire you as a consultant, you know, right? You have to have an expertise. Uh, if I need management consulting help, I want to know that they've got that expertise, right? So I think that's really important to be mindful of, is that it's a roadmap. You know, I have people that work for me who start and they want to be a digital marketing director, but you just started. How can I make you a director? You got to work your, it's a progression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I like to echo that. I think most companies that want to hire you want to know that you have um, hands-on experience, like you said, get your hands dirty first. I was actually, my first job was a director of a senior department, but then I had summer job experience, uh, working for, uh, you know, $3 or 350 an hour in those days. And uh, I have some experience working with, with seniors. So when I graduated with a graduate degree, I was made a director of a department. Not a huge department at the time, but uh, at least I have some experience. So I think you need some work experience in order to be able to advise others because they want more than theoretical knowledge. I get the New York Times on Sunday. It's the only, the only time I, I get the Times. And I play a little game in the... Did anybody read it on Sunday? It's sometimes worthwhile. Um, nobody? I'll start reading the New York Times, okay? And get the newspaper, not the online version, okay? <laughs> the tactile sense of paper. I got it on my iPhone. Uh, <laughs> gee, I'm not surprised. <laughs> the tactile sense of newsprint is just marvelous. The smell of ink, it uh, opens up a whole new world for you. Okay, um, and I play a game with the, uh, in the, I think it's the style section or something. Uh, they, have, they, they, have, they have wedding announcements. And um, I, I, I have about a 30% success factor because I always go to the default. I look at the pictures of people and I try and figure out what they do for a living. Because I don't know why it's important when you're putting a wedding announcement to announce what you do for a living. I, you know, I think it's more important you tell what color, what your favorite color is or your favorite 15th century German philosopher is and what you do. But it's an advertisement thing. Okay, so usually the, the, the default is lawyer or hedge fund trader. To this day, I still don't know what a hedge fund is, so you can tell me afterwards, okay? Um, uh, the point I'm trying to get is I've never seen a collection, larger collection, 23-year-old vice presidents. I don't know. Where do they come from? You know, everybody's the vice president of something. And I think that's an unfair disadvantage that's being put on young people these days. I've got to have the top job. Well, you're not going to get the top job unless you're exceptional. Okay? Like I said, I worked Christmas days on construction sites. I worked reading week when other kids were going to, uh, to um, uh, Switzerland skiing. Was I bitter? Not much. <laughs> okay? And went up through there. So you've got to be, you got to be prepared to do that. Are you know getting past the 50 uh, 
age group category, and there are going to be tremendous needs that, are, I mean, yeah, there are going to be tremendous needs coming from that particular group. And uh, innovators, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. will, you know, be finding out ways to satisfy those needs. So, in my opinion, you know, healthcare services pertaining to that mm -hmm. age group. And some of the statistics I can share with you today, just in North America, there's about 110 million people over the age of 50. I'd like to echo that completely. That's why I went to uh, study gerontology 30 years ago for today. Uh, in the year 2030, the senior population in Canada will be over 20%. And there will be fewer young people working to support the seniors, the baby boomers. And um, healthcare is a big thing. Another one is, is really environmental issues and also food. Um, not just about food security, but the quality of our food. I think with the aging population, there's more and more efforts or, or concern paid to the food that we eat. Uh, pesticides, um, hormones in, 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 in uh, feed for animals, uh, what kind of meat are we eating? So I think there is a whole uh, growth industry for organic food as well. And um, more and more, People wanting to raise your chickens in the backyard. So that that if you think along that line, thinking about quality of life, uh, limits to growth, and environmental issues. Okay, my uh, my industry is the second largest growth industry in in North America. It's a very invisible industry, though, and it's thought of as being a low level, low paying, low to low motivation. Um, um, career and at the entry level it's all of those satisfies all of your all of your menial um, uh, requirements however it's growing phenomenally in all areas and and as much as I as much as I uh, smugly claim to be data phobic I'm a dinosaur it can't exist that way anymore okay more more crime is being committed online more and more crime is being committed through through the electronic um, Network. Yesterday, I had I had lunch with a very with a very senior partner of um, a Bay Street law firm, um, really really bright man who uh, you know carries around more in his pocket, money wise than I've ever earned in my lifetime. And he was telling me about how important um, because I'm getting back into business, in private investigators are because of the limited kinds of support they're getting from the police departments. Okay, Police, the RCMP has one main mandate these days, terrorism, okay? To me, I think it's ridiculous, okay? But it's, the sexy, it's a sexy crime. Everything else has to be related to terrorism. I did intellectual property protection, piracy. The only reason we got the, the horsemen involved in these things, uh, gee, it's gonna be on tape, <laughs> okay? Because it'll be outside my house tonight, is trying to relate it to, to terrorism. And we, we found that there was organized crime crime elements who were funding their terrorist activities through the sell, sale of counterfeit products. And that is absolutely true, okay? So my industry has huge potential. Forensic accountants, um, they're, 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 going to be the, they're going to be the new gurus in our business. The technology, um, um, I go to an annual conference um, of security geeks in the United States. I've been for a few years, but if you can imagine the, the floor of Sky Dome times two, filled with security products, that's it. There is actually an alarm system now that comes in an aerosol can. You spray an alarm system, okay? Like this stuff just blows my mind, all right? But there's still the need for the guy in the car to watch the warehouse at night, okay? And I did that here at York University not too long ago to see if people were stealing. There's still a need for the guy to take a statement from somebody about a really horrible incident where you have to show empathy, where you have to, where you have to um, relate to that person, okay? So, you know, if you're interested in, 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 in that, that area, I don't know, is anybody interested in law enforcement or whatever, come and, come and speak with me afterwards. Thanks. I'd say in, in my industry, I still see a lot of companies that have grown over the years by mergers and acquisitions. They've bought other companies. Uh, they've had to integrate their, their IT and their, and their core business processes and their people. Um, and, and so there's still a, I still see a lot of opportunity in, uh, in the area of helping companies to deal with those business problems. How do you rationalize two uh, similar or dissimilar businesses that have come together and harmonize them so that their IT, their process, everything works together? 
the companies that uh, that I've worked with uh, range from in telco industries to high tech companies like IBM to financial services. And the one unifying problem that I've seen across all of those industries is nobody knows how to deal with their data. Um, they, they don't have a good handle, generally speaking, on their products and on their customers. The companies that have excelled in, in those areas are the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world. Um, they've mastered the data. They've mastered the information that tells them who their customers are. I think the, the companies that, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the area of e-business intel uh, business intelligence, data analytics, data warehousing, um, and those things that give business a competitive advantage uh, in terms of being able to better take the products or services that they sell and identify the right set of customers at the right opportunities. I see that as a real growth area. I'm sorry, my, my friend here has just introduced three areas which we're integrally involved in. You, you know, again, you think if you watch too much TV, you think all private eyes do is drink a lot of beer and chase women. Competitive intelligence is an area that I got involved with, with major corporations. It was a hard sell because it was the, there's a fine line between corporate espionage and competitive intelligence. Protecting your information is protecting against corporate espionage. I told you I was the corporate security manager in Northern Telecom in the, in the 80s when we were dealing with spies. It's just being revealed now that the uh, Chinese security services infiltrated Northern Telecom. I can tell you that's absolutely true. Okay, no doubt about it. We knew about it in the 80s, all right? So that's, um, that's true. And what was the other thing you talked about? You're talking about? Yep. Business intelligence. Yeah. Uh, protecting I, your data. I, well, definitely protecting your yeah. data. Yeah. Okay, great. Online learning and lifelong learning is uh, growing at an unprecedented rate. The University of Phoenix Online has 300,000 online students. Uh, in Canada, it's at its infancy. Um, the whole lifelong learning paradigm is shifting rapidly because the notion of freedom 55 I may not look it, but I just turned 50 last year, so uh, I'm getting all of a sudden spammed about all these wonderful retirement products and, you know, products for older people. A bit offensive, I might add, but, you know, I still play hockey. I'm on the ice four times a week because I coach my daughter and I play with my kids as well, my, my boys, and it just... You know, the whole uh, aging population, there are a number of different industries that have been referenced here that will require a huge amount of service and support. So wherever you think you fit in best, whether it's if you are, have a kinesiology degree and you want to be a personal trainer and start your own personal training business, that would be a good business, you know? But, you know, lifelong learning and online learning, you're going to have, what's the estimate, five day careers in your life? Five day careers. So don't, don't think narrowly in, in, uh, for one career path because you will be doing many as we have up here. 